everyone, welcome to CFB. My name is Sue Shardlow and I'm your host. Today we're here to learn about the future of HTML controls with Stephanie Stimak. Before I introduce Stephanie, I want to let you know that today's event has been brought to you with the support of Stratic. Try them for free at app.stratic.com slash sign up and launch darkly. Netlify. There's been so many uh, talks that we've done recently that have used Netlify, so please do check them out. And Covery, the simplest way to deploy your full stack applications. And don't forget to check out our video library. All of our previous talks are there, more than 100 of them now, including our August meetups and databases made easy from July. And just as a reminder, you can check out the recording of today's talk at the same URL you're at now, straight after we finish this broadcast. Our Discord server is ready for you. So if you want to continue the conversation outside of the meetups, join us there. I will drop the link in the chat for you. And you can also find us on Patreon. Thanks so much to those of you who are already supporting us. You can do so from as little as $2 a month. And also if you work for a company that would like to pledge some money to help us with our running costs, then uh, please let us know. Uh, don't worry, the meetups will always be free, but if you become a patron, then uh, you can get a discount to our conferences and our paid workshops. And just so for anyone, any one of you that are new today, and a reminder for those of you that have attended our events before, this session is being recorded. Like I said, you can check out the recording straight after we finish in about an hour's time. Just press refresh on the URL you're at now and you will get the recording. Please ask your questions in the chat. Stephanie will answer them after she's finished speaking. And please send any feedback that you've got to brian at cfe.dev. So now on to today's speaker. Stephanie is a program manager for developer experiences on Microsoft Edge, uh, who comes from a background in web and user interface design, as well as front end development. She loves mountain biking, and she's here to talk to us today about the future of HTML controls. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Go ahead and share my screen. Um, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm super excited to be here today doing another virtual talk. Um, again, my name is Stephanie, um, and I'm a program manager on the Microsoft Edge Developer Experiences team, and I am super excited to talk to you today about HTML form controls, um, which it turns out are a massive pain point for developers, even though they're some of the most commonly used pieces of UI. Um, so today I'm gonna give a brief overview of the past and present of form controls, um, sort of talk about how we got to where we are today, uh, the current problems we have with controls, and um, how browsers and standards groups are proposing we solve these pain points for developers. So let's dive into a little bit of history. Um, so in 1995, uh, the HTML 2.0 specification uh, became the first official specification that was ratified by the W3C. And with that specification, uh, that came our first set of standardized form controls. But the specification didn't standardize form parts or how they were constructed. It only standardized the method to enter data into an HTML document and for that data to be used to perform an action, such as logging into a website. So it standardized what the forms were supposed to do, but not how they're built. So we have some standardized HTML building blocks in 1995. Uh, we can build some websites but we're, we're missing something at this time. Um, we're lacking a standardized styling language. And so CSS wasn't supported by HTML until HTML 3.20 in 1997. And it wasn't even until 1999 that browsers really embraced and supported CSS uh, with the 4.01 specification. So if we go back to 1995, um, we have form controls, but we have no styling language to style them. So browsers had to rely on the operating system to render and style those form controls, and that sort of led to a technical dependency on the operating system for styling and rendering. Um, later, even with those early versions of CSS, um, there were parts of the form controls that CSS just wasn't able to access um, for developers to style. 
But the other side of this is that a browser vendor, browser vendors were also extremely reluctant um, to make controls styleable because they were a reflection of the operating system's visual appearance. And so the idea that developers would want to change that kind of UI um, and make them look different wasn't really like a concept. And so when browser vendors finally accepted that developers wanted to be able to change the appearance of controls, we were given the appearance property. But this only controls uh, the system level styling and developers didn't actually use it for its intended purpose. And it wasn't even actually implemented as it was designed in the specification um, by the different browsers. And that led to so many different issues, um, lots of like partial support and interoperability issues and Internet Explorer, which at one point was the browser with the most dominant market share, like didn't even support it. So it kind of just made things a mess with styling controls. And so if we jump forward now, if we jump forward 26 years, um, that's 26 years of the web evolving uh, that's led us to now. Um, and the web has definitely improved since then and form controls have uh, improved since then. But in those 26 years, we haven't really done anything to make uh, native form controls easier to work with, um, even though there have been improvements. And again, we've added some new ones. So if we sort of look at the state of styling current controls today, I've got them bucketed out into three categories. And most of the controls that we really want more control over styling are in our third bucket, which I call the good night and good luck bucket because of how hard it is to style these if you can even style them at all with just CSS. And then additionally, on top of that, um, with our native controls, we have, uh, we have browser inconsistencies in the way they look. So as someone who comes from a background in design, like before I knew about the web platform, it was so hard uh, to explain why my form controls look differently in different browsers to my clients when I was building a website. And that was so frustrating. And this again boils down to that issue we discussed initially um, that form controls and their parts weren't standardized. So browsers so browser engineers built and styled these differently. And, and this is just looking at some of the top browsers. This isn't even all the browsers out there on the market. And then additionally, on top of poor CSS access um, and those browser inconsistencies, we can't actually extend the functionality of a native control. Um, this tweet from Scott Gell, I think, sums things up perfectly. You have one problem. You want icons in your select menu options. You decide to make a custom select menu. You now have at least 75 problems. And when you rebuild a control from scratch, um, instead of using the native control, you don't get all the good stuff that's already baked in by the platform, like accessibility and security and even performance. And so you have to add all that back in as a developer, and then you have to test all of that. Um, and it's a, it's a bad developer experience, and it's time consuming, but it's necessary when you can't extend your controls the, the way you need to. Um, a great example of this is the video element, where uh, a developer either gets all of the controls um, or none of them simply by adding or removing the controls attribute. You can't customize that at all. It's either all or nothing. And so when we want our HTML controls to look like this, um, or even this, um, it's no wonder that developers have just reverted to building forms from scratch. And so on the browser side, um, we decided to take a step back um, and ask some questions um, because we wanted to make sure that this was an area to go invest in. Um, we knew it was a pain point for developers, but our better native form control was something that developers really, really want. Um, and the answer was very overwhelmingly, yes, developers want better form controls. They're a headache to work with as they are right now. And so my colleague, Greg Whitworth, 
um, at the time, he ran an initial survey on Twitter to start to dive deep into this space. And he had a variety of respondents, about 1,400, um, from different roles, from full stack engineers to designers, um, with varying degrees of experience working on the web. And one of the questions that he asked was, which form controls um, did those survey respondents recreate the most? And these were the top 10. Um, select was the most recreated with 10.7% saying select, followed closely by checkbox and then date, uh, radio file, progress button, dialogue, text area, and text. And then he wanted to know the reasons why uh, controls are being rebuilt. And over a third said it was because they couldn't change the appearance sufficiently. Another third just wanted to add functionality, so they wanted to extend their control. And then just under a third uh, said, again, because of browser inconsistencies, which we can probably assume has to do with appearance. So if we group that in with that first third of developers who couldn't change the appearance sufficiently, that's two thirds of developers recreating form controls purely for appearance reasons. That's a lot of developer time. And then Greg followed up with an amended survey um, with JSConf EU attendees in 2019, and he asked two additional questions. He asked which form control gives you the most frustration and why? And Select clearly stole, stole the show here with nearly 50% of respondents saying Select. The second re, um, form control, barely at 17%. And so these were some of the verbatims that Greg got when uh, respondents answered that why question. And so one said Select requires hacky tricks. Can't style the option elements at all to the extent we need to but the amount of work it takes to implement an accessible alternative with complete feature parity is massive. And I can just feel the pain in this response here. So this sort of prompted me to do my own research. Um, I wanted to know how painful is it for developers to recreate a select element. And so I asked um, front end, I asked, design and developer Twitter um, to please fill in the blank. Um, I would rather blank than attempt to style a native select element. And it turns out y'all really do not like select at all. Um, I had over 250 responses to this tweet and all of the responses were very painful things. Um, so I'll just highlight a couple of my favorites here. So. I would rather call each person attempting to use the form and ask them what option they would like. Um, I'd rather build the entire site in Flash. I'd rather support IE6. I'd rather chew on glass. Um, I'd rather boil my toes in lava. And then this is still my favorite, um, even after two years. Um, maybe a bit melodramatic, but heat up a rusty old fork with a few tines snapped off and broke it and broken, and then with both arms, thrust it into my inner thigh, then attempt to style a native select menu. So clearly, this is a, this is a pain point for developers. So let's talk about um, the future and, and what's coming and what's actually in progress right now um, to make controls better. Um, and I'm excited to say that the future is so shiny and exciting. There's been so much work happening um, on the browser side and in standards groups um, to improve controls with the help of the web development community. So first off, um, Microsoft Edge, we've been leading the controls work and collaborating closely with Chrome um, to make updates to the native controls in the Chromium project. So our first focus um, about a year and a half ago was improving the style of native controls in all the Chromium browsers um, and bringing accessibility improvements to those controls. And so we brought over some of the accessibility work from uh, the Edge HTML engine over into Chromium when we made that switch. 
And then with the new styles, um, the team landed on a much more modern and neutral look. And the hope is here that this lessens the time spent recreating form controls purely for styling purposes um, while we work on the standards uh, work to bring better control styling to browsers. And so, um, but that's not all we've done to native controls in Chromium. Um, this is the latest update we have um, for native controls in Chromium. Um, I'm excited to share dark mode for form controls in the Chromium browser. Um, and so with this, uh, when a web developer expresses support for dark mode and the user has that mode enabled, um, our user agent style sheet is going to auto darken form controls out of the box, um, like you see here on this slide. And so, like normal, um, any styles that are added by a web developer or a user will override the user agent style. Um, so, if you've made your text input background like bright yellow, uh, you'll need to update that color yourself in dark mode using the prefers color scheme media query. Um, but to, to render all document form controls in dark mode, um, you, all you need is a, a meta, meta tag declaration um, to let the browser know uh, which color modes the website supports. And so our declaration here just tells the browser that it's safe to render controls as light or dark. And this is available in Microsoft Edge on the desktop in version 87, um, Chrome for Android version 91, and future versions of Microsoft Edge for Android. And you can find out more information about that and how to implement it um, at this URL here at aka.ms backslash dark dash controls. Um, and next up, I want to talk about HTML because HTML, it's not done. I mean, it's, it's a living language. And so um, we're looking at new native components. And a lot of these proposals are coming out of our research um, and work that has started with rebuilding the select element. And so while looking at how we wanted to build a new version of select, uh, the team identified this need for a universal pop-up element. And so this proposed pop-up element is a transient user interface that's displayed on top of all other web UI. And these are things like action menus, form element suggestions, content pickers, and teaching UI. And so the key differentiator here for a pop-up element from other aesthetically similar elements is something we call light dismiss behavior. And so light dismiss behavior means that the pop-up will automatically be hidden when either the user hits the escape key, um, the layout of the pop-up or its anchor element is changed, or focus moves outside of the pop-up and its anchor element if applicable. And so a generalized definition of this light dismiss behavior is currently being discussed in the Open UI Standards group, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And so examples of elements that don't um, have this light dismiss behavior are things like alerts, toasts, custom tooltips, and other uh, miscellaneous persistent popover UI. And so let's take just a quick look at a basic example um, for the pop-up element. So here we have a button element and a pop-up element. And to tie the button to the pop-up, we have our button ID equals menu button. And we'd use an anchor attribute and set that value to the button ID of menu button. Um, and currently, right now, pop-up menus are not visible until show is called by the author. So we do need some script here. Um, there are a lot more details on pop-up in the pop-up explainer. So if you're interested in reading through that, um, go ahead and check out that link at aka.ms backslash pop-up dash explainer. And so there's also some other exciting controls and controls related work in progress. Um, so we have a demo of tabs. Um, this is, uh, again, an initial demo of what tabs could look like in the browser. And so this is all experimental um, and would require proposing some new elements. Um, but this is getting the work started to figure out if this would meet developers' needs. So if you're interested in this demo and providing some feedback on that, you can go to aka.ms backslash tabs dash demo. 
Um, another thing that we're working on is something called anchored positioning. And this is a proposal to allow the anchoring or pinning of a top layer UI, like the pop-up um, we see here, uh, to a specific point on another element. And so how the top layer UI is positioned with respect to its anchor element is further influenced or constrained by the edges of the layout's viewport. So in our example here, um, we have a menu whose top left point is anchored to the bottom left point on a menu button. And when there's insufficient space in the viewport below the button, the pop-up menu would be rendered above the menu instead. And so if you're interested in uh, reading that proposal, you can go to aka.ms backslash anchor dash POS. And now uh, let's talk about fixing the current problems with controls. Um, this is the stuff that I'm most excited about. Um, so last uh, year, August 2020, um, an explainer with proposed solutions for how we're going to approach enabling customization of Controls UI was released um, by the Chrome, Edge, and Open UI teams. So the proposal for form controls is using something called the MVC design pattern, um, where the form control is made up of three distinct parts, a model, a view, and a controller. And now the goals that this proposal set out to accomplish revolve around enabling as much, as much customization as possible um, while reducing the overhead for the developer. And so we're proposing three different solutions that offer a range of flexibility and customization depending on what the developer wants. So in our first solution here, um, in that brief history of controls that I talked about, um, the root of the issue is that form controls and their parts are not standardized and therefore they're not reachable by developers. And so OpenUI um, is the initiative under the YCG, which is the Web Incubator Community Group, to standardize form controls and components. Uh, the OpenUI team, which is open to anyone who is interested in participating, um, is focused on researching and documenting design systems and frameworks that are out there today. Um, they're identifying patterns that are in naming and different use cases. And they're using those patterns to establish cow paths um, for standards and eventually browsers when it comes to controls. And so because select was the biggest pain point for developers in that survey, um, it was the first form control that OpenUI started to research. And there's actually an editor's draft proposal for select in OpenUI um, if you want to go check that out. And so when I talk about standardizing control anatomy, I'll use select here as an example of what that looks like. Um, so the anatomy of a select could be defined as consisting of one button part containing one selected value part and one pop-up list box part that contains zero to N option parts. And then after defining that anatomy, we'd go on to define the expected behavior of a select, um, what happens when you click it, and so on. And so this standardized anatomy will allow the styling of native parts using pseudo classes and the part pseudo element. So a developer will be able to change the color of a selects button in an interoperable manner without replacing any of the HTML. So in our example here, um, we have our CSS class called styled select, and we're utilizing the part pseudo element to target the button to change the background color. Now notice here, the HTML code is just the code of a select today. So you wouldn't have to actually rewrite any of the form control. We're just exposing the parts of a select and giving devs access to that styling via the pseudo elements and classes. And additionally, um, obviously, other states will be uh, standardized. So for example, the open state here for, for select um, would be standardized. Now our second uh, proposal is, um, our second proposal enables more powerful customization of controls and, con and content within the controls. Um, and this is with something called named slots. 
So a set of slot names uh, will correspond to each piece of the controller's view that a developer might want to replace with their own content. So in the case of select, we would have slot equals button and slot equals list box. And that will indicate to the platform that custom content will be slotted in by the developer. Um, in addition to this, developers would add part equals button and part equals list box, which I'll go into briefly in a moment about why that's needed. Um, but if you've ever wanted to add like a country flag or some other visual content into your list box um, for select, which is just the drop down, um, this will allow you to do that without having to rewrite the whole control from scratch. Um, and slots also provide the flexibility to customize only certain parts of the control. So let's take input type equals range as an example. Um, a developer could come um, and the UI for the track would automatically fall back to the default provided by the platform. And so you might be asking, why do I have to provide both a part and a slot name? And so by adding part to your code, this is going to signal to the web platform that it has code to wire up to your control, and the platform will apply native event handlers where applicable to handle user input, which means developers can make UI tweaks without having to write tons of JavaScript. And the platform will also apply the correct accessibility semantics to your controls as well when you apply those parts. And so this is just letting the platform do what it was meant to do and applying that accessibility for you out of the box. All you have to do as a developer is add your parts. And then our final solution here is um, the Shadow DOM replacement. So um, currently, Attach Shadow throws an exception. You can't call it on any form control currently. And so we're proposing that this restriction be removed when enabling customization for a given control type. And calling attach shadow um, will result in the default user agent shadow DOM being swapped out with a new shadow root that will be populated with content provided by the developer to create better controls. Um, developers will still be required to label the core parts of their shadow DOM using the part attribute. Otherwise, the shadow DOM will not be rendered. Um, the platform just was not going to make an attempt to guess um, at the correct behavior, and it won't render an incomplete control implementation. So just add your parts. Um, if you're interested in the full explainer for that, you can head to aka.ms backslash controls dash explainer. There's a lot more technical detail um, in that explainer that I don't have time to go into today. So go ahead and give that a read. Um, and finally, um, we need you as developers. So we need your feedback and your opinions on this work um, because we want, we want to ensure that we're building what you need and it meets your needs. Um, and so there are multiple ways you can get involved. So you can either contribute to the form control investigations on OpenUI. Again, um, there's a Discord and we have weekly meetings. Um, Tell browser vendors what it is you need from your form controls, um, especially if there's a form control that doesn't exist that you think would make a great native um, control. And then additionally, provide feedback on the explainers. Um, I feel like every couple months we have a new explainer coming out with some proposed either new HTML element or CSS. Um, and so that's just another avenue for you to um, provide feedback on that when those come out. Because we want, again, we want your opinions on this. Um, and then you can go ahead and follow these folks. Um, Craig Whitworth, is he's now at Salesforce, but he runs the OpenUI working group. Um, Stubbornella is Nicole Sullivan. She's the Google Chrome PM working on, working on this. And I'm Ciata, um on the Microsoft Edge team. Uh, and I'm here to help Greg and my my dev team um, on the Edge team who are building controls, you can always ping me um, on Twitter with your questions. Because we're here to listen, um, because these improvements, they're for you. Thank you.
Thank you, Stephanie. Everyone's going absolutely wild for these new features. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the most popular one by far is dark mode, as you probably uh, predict. But yeah, everyone's really excited to get their hands on this and start playing with it. So we do have a couple of questions, and I really want to encourage folks to ask any questions that you've got. We have got plenty of time. We're scheduled to be here until on the hour, whatever time that means for you. For me, that's 7 p.m. Uh, for some of you, that's going to be 11 a.m. or uh, 2 p.m. But yes, yeah, so please post your questions and we will uh, put them to Stephanie. So the first question is, you spoke about parts. Do you think all browser vendors will adopt parts? That's the goal. So I know that there, so even though this stuff is happening in, um, just in um, Edge and it seems like just Edge and Chrome are uh, leading this work, but this work is actually being, um, we're collaborating very closely with the Open UI Working Group, and they've actually gone into W3C um, standards meetings with the other browser vendors to talk about this stuff and sort of try and figure out um, if this is the right direction and, and get agreement on that. I can't speak for Firefox and um, Apple, um, but for the most part, there's been a lot of positive reception to this approach. Cool, yeah. Somebody has actually posted in the chat that they saw in can I use.com that part attribute is starting to be supported by some browser vendors. So, yeah, that's definitely good news. So, the next question is Would anchored positioning that you spoke about allow elements to pop outside of iframes? Um, I'd have to go back and look at the explainer. I believe there is a restriction on iframes due to security issues. Um, but uh, I'd go check that explainer to double check my answer. <laughs> no worries, yeah, I did post all the links in the chat for folks. So uh, if, if anyone wants to go check that out, that is, uh, the link is in the chat. Um, John would like to know what the best way to tell the various browser vendors what we need from our form controls and other web platform requests. Um, so, some of the, so I highlighted a couple uh, folks who are well. So Nicole Sullivan is on the Google team. Um, if you tweet us, um, that's one way to get feedback. Uh, a number of the um, different browser vendors all have something called a platform status page. And um, you can, some of them um, have that on GitHub. And so you could go file issues on their GitHub for platform status um, or even filing bugs, I think, in some cases, like go file a bug in Chromium. Um, I can't think of the link for that off the top of my head, but um, that's another approach. Um, so, Twitter, or even even if if you have like, um, even if you just write a blog post about it, like if there's something that doesn't exist in the browser, um, you can write a blog post and share that with um, some folks on Twitter. Like I'm just full disclosure, I'm always on Twitter. So if you're like tweeting me something about something you need in the browser, um, I'm very receptive to that. And also, um, I also run an initiative called The Web We Want. So you can go to webwewant.fyi. Um, and that's another way to give feedback on missing features, not just for controls, but the web platform as a whole. Um, and we check those submissions weekly. Um, and uh, that is a cross-browser um, effort. So I work with folks on the Chrome team and Firefox and Agalia and Samsung Internet um, to, to sort of triage all those things that come in on the web we want as well. Cool. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So, you, um, going back to, um, parts kind of, somebody's asking, do other vendors have alternative solutions like parts that you know of? Not that I know of. No. Okay. No worries. Um, and Barry's, Curious to know if there's any work being done on easily integrated search or autocomplete via select, including dynamic load options. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know. Um, 
but select is still, I will say, so we have a select editor's draft, but select is still something that is being heavily discussed often in those open UI groups. Um, uh, and actually another way to give feedback about things you want in your controls is open UI, they have a GitHub, you can go file an issue um, asking about those sorts of things and someone will respond to you too. Cool. Okay, we're nearly at the end of the question. So I just want to encourage folks again, if you've got any questions, um, please do post them in the chat. For those of you folks who did uh, pop in a little bit uh, late, so you missed the beginning, the recording will be available at the same URL you're at now. So if you uh, press refresh as soon as we finish, then you can recap all the parts of Stephanie's talk that you uh, that you missed the first time round. So we won't recap that now, but if you need to do that, please press refresh at the end and you'll get the, the replay. So um, another question from Barry. So Barry did ask just now about um, integrating search and autocomplete. And Barry also wants to know if there's any possible enhancements to date or an integrated date time control. Um, not, no, not at the moment, um, but that is another control that uh, will be looked at in OpenUI. Just so many things, like you say, it's, these these things are old. A lot of them have never been uh, really and, changed. Yeah, and even just with like select, like having sat in on quite a few of these open UI meetings, like the amount of detail into just like a single behavior of what a select should do will take the full 45 minutes. And so it's like, it's quite complex sometimes, just even the, the smallest thing that we may think um, is like a simple interaction is actually, again, we wanna make sure that we build it the way developers want. And so it takes quite a bit of discussion from all different folks. Yeah, like I can imagine as well, because you need to make sure things are inclusive and accessible too. So yeah. you, you could be designing for somebody that's completely abled, uh, who said, I want this, and they haven't thought about folks that can't access it the same way that they can. So, so you definitely need to look at all of that stuff as well, which is why nothing's ever yeah. a quick, quick thing to uh, implement. So uh, Jane J. Thornton wants to know, a number of these initiatives seem to be in their infancy. It was mentioned that Edge and Chromium is not necessarily in parity with Apple or Firefox, do you think that this will lead to another break in browser support where developers will need to start coding for particular browsers? I think that's a really good question, actually. Um, I So I, I think so with some of the control stuff, I think what initially is going to happen is some of these features will be behind a flag. So it won't be on by default, but they'll be available for developers to start playing with. And that already sort of that happens with things in Firefox as well, with things like subgrid for speaking CSS. And so, uh, but the, I, I don't think you'll have to start just coding for uh, specific browsers. That's, that's not the goal. Like we don't want people to have to do that. And um, if I am remembering correctly as well, with these new controls, um, that we want to implement where we also don't want to break um, the old version of controls. And so we don't want to update, you know, how uh, select functions um, and then break a bunch of sites that maybe aren't maintained very well. And so there will be some sort of fallback method um, to ensure that when these new capabilities come to browsers, we don't just break all of the web. <laughs> Yeah, you'll be famous if you do. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's another reason why when you're sitting in these meetings deciding, you know, what you're going to implement and how you're going to do it, it's all about how this, this is going to fit in and be rolled out as well, isn't it? It's not just about how it's going to look in the end. Yeah. Because you don't move from one state to the other. There's going to be some places in between. Yeah. Cool. A lot of that is, again, like, um, again, I know it seems like Edge and Chrome are leading this work, but they lots a lot of the things that I've discussed, like anchor positioning um, and pop up, that those are things, those are conversations we have in the open UI group, um, which is comprised of Edge and Chrome folks. 
but those conversations then get moved to the standards groups. So with like W3C working groups and they're discussed by people, not just working in browsers, but just on the web as a whole as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely a lot of due diligence going on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, somebody did um, miss the bit where you talked about checkbox and radio inputs and I have to be honest, I can't remember what you said about this either. So they were wondering if there's any proposed changes to checkbox or radio inputs. Um, I don't think I discussed those. Um, they're, I think those are lower on the list and there may be, um, I'm trying to recall. I can't think of any work that's been done because select's been the focused one, but I believe there are discussions happening in some of the open UI issues on GitHub about checkbox and radio. Okay, cool. Um, and yeah, so we've only got one more question left. So again, I would encourage folks, if you've got any questions, please do get them in. This is your last chance. We do have plenty of time, but uh, if you don't ask them now, then we're, we're going forever. Stephanie's not coming back. Well, maybe in the future, <laughs> but um, not anytime soon anyway. So uh, the final question that I've got for the moment, unless anyone else gets in there before we say goodbye, it is the million dollar question actually. When do you think these changes could be in place? Well, I, I don't have an answer for this question. It's really hard to answer because there are so many different moving parts. Um, but I believe there's at least a prototype coming for select that will be behind a flag relatively soonish in the in web standards time. So I don't have a definitive answer, but um, if you stay tuned in the open UI group, there's all sorts of information that gets shared there. Good tip. Yeah, that's a that's a good place to stay uh, if you want to stay ahead of the curve and find yeah. out things. But um, so I guess the answer to that is it's not going to be next week, but it might be before the end of COVID. But uh, <laughs> we don't know when that's going away. So I think that's probably a safe bet if we, if we leave it at that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that is the uh, the end of the question. So thanks once again, Stephanie, for coming and sharing all of that with us. Everyone's so excited about this. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, it's really nice that you're uh, open to folks contacting you on Twitter as well, that you're ever present on there. I know that's a full time job in itself, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, please do check out those resources that uh, Stephanie posted and uh, feel free to reach out to folks on Twitter if you want to uh, to give your feedback or request anything or just give your point of view, um, etc. But, yeah, thanks again, Stephanie. Yeah. Cool. So thanks to everybody for joining us today. We have got somebody almost as famous as Stephanie coming in for our next meetup. On the 14th of October, we have got Cassidy Williams from Netflix. Net Netlify, not Netflix. Netlify uh, coming in to talk to us about Astro, so don't miss that. That will be on the cfe.dev website for you to sign up for in the next few days, so please book your space on that free meetup as soon as you can. So until then, look after yourselves and take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye.